All right, so we'll start off with something simple, like number four, for example. When it comes to finding limits analytically, it sometimes is as straightforward as substituting in your limiting constant. All right, so our limiting constant here is the number three. All right, so each x in the expression gets replaced with a three. And then you simplify, all right? Now that that's not bad, all right? So nine times four, 36, plus three, 39, minus five, 34. All right, so not bad at all. So let me show you what this looks like on Desmos, all right? Because that's going to be the key to everything. And that's why we spend so much time creating graphs, because those graph characteristics dictate whether a limit exists or not, all right? And the continuity that we've been talking about. So let me graph f of x equals 4x squared plus x minus five, all right? So ordinary parabola. At that point of interest, x equals three, all right? I'll just make that a dashed line. I'm gonna go up to the parabola, see what's going on there. At the parabola, we have a clean point, three comma 34, all right? And that's because the function f of x is equal to 4x squared plus x minus 5 is everywhere continuous. All right, that's a key ingredient because if you could recognize a function as continuous, depending on where it's continuous, that could dictate how difficult it'll be to find your limit. All right, if a function is everywhere continuous, then the result of the limit is simply f of whatever the limiting constant is, in this case, f of three, all right? AKA the y value at the given x value, all right? But that's only if we know that the function is everywhere continuous. If it's not, then you got a problem, all right? So the question becomes, well, how do we know if a function is continuous? Well, we look for things that, are, that, that illustrate discontinuities, like asymptotes or holes or jumps, anything along those lines, bless you. So if we identify those important markers at a particular x value, then we know that it's not gonna be as simple as just plugging in whatever the limiting constant is. So in number six, let me pop that function in. Okay, right, so fraction, paren, x plus two, close it up, square it, minus four over x. And go back to the standard zoom. Looks like a line, all right? Graphically, it looks like a line. The original function looked like anything but a line. Uh, we're interested in x equals zero, so I'll slide my slider over to zero. Oops, if it'll land on zero, come on. Get on zero and stay there, okay. So going up to zero, well, wherever the graph exists at the x value of zero. I had it there for a second, but you'll see zero gives undefined, right? But there is a location, there's a clearly defined location of four, right? So I know the limit is gonna be four. I have to prove it analytically though, right? So common sense tells me, all right, this is approaching four from the left, it's approaching four from the right, so it's gonna be four, I need to justify it. So one technique I could try would be to replace each of the x values with a zero. So we'd get zero plus two squared minus four over zero. So zero plus two squared is two squared, which is four, minus four is zero. So you get zero over zero the inclination is to say, no solution, we got, we got zero on the bottom of a fraction, it's all over. This is not 
an undefined situation. This is what's known as indeterminate. All right, indeterminate. All right, what that actually means is that it's, it's not as simple as saying that there is no answer. It's saying that there is an answer, we just don't know what it is. And we, have, we don't have the capability of figuring it out in its current form. For our purposes, that means we need to do some algebra. All right, so it's giving us a set of instructions indirectly, as indirectly as it can, I guess. It's saying simplify your original expression. So simplify and then resubstitute, all right? So it's already in a factored form, so let me distribute it out. x plus two squared, x squared plus four x plus four, minus the four that's already there over the x that's already there. It's still a limit, so don't lose your limit. Limit as x approaches zero. You're not gonna be happy with me when I take off credit if you disregard the limit, right? Because what people do is when they show work for this, they just kind of forget that this is a thing and they'll only write this part of it and they'll forget the limit. They'll just kind of drop it. And so I'll forget to give you full credit. So just be careful about that, all right? So four negative four cancels away x squared plus 4x, got a common factor there, I'll pull it out, x times x plus 4 over x. You can combine steps as long as you're not skipping too many of them. If you're not sure, just ask. All right, that common factor of x cancels away, and now we have limit as x approaches 0 of x plus 4. Now I can go through the process again of substituting in my limiting constant. My limiting constant is zero, that goes in for x. Now I have justification to ditch the limit because I'm applying the limit. I'm replacing the, z the x with a zero, so zero plus four is equal to a four, and so that's my limit. We already knew it graphically going in, we needed to figure it out analytically. All right. So this is, it's really kind of, it's more skill building than anything else because as you work your way up through your studies involving calculus, what's gonna happen is you're gonna find that a lot of the things that you learn about can easily be done using technology, but then eventually you get to a point where none of it can be done using technology. It all has to be done by hand, right? Because what happens is you're looking at a two-dimensional grapher, the Desmos calculator. There are three-dimensional graphers. Uh, you've probably used GeoGebra in the past. We'll use it a little bit this year. There aren't too many four-dimensional graphers, five-dimensional graphers, uh, definitely not any five-dimensional graphers. But what you're supposed to be able to do is take what you've learned in two-dimensional, three-dimensional mathematics and apply it to higher order dimensions. And you might say, well, how, how is there five dimensions in the physical world? Anytime you incorporate an additional variable, you're incorporating a different dimension. It just not, it might not manifest itself visually. Like we can perceive visually three dimensions, length, width, and height. Throw in temperature, now you have a fourth dimension. Throw in the passage of time, now you have a fifth dimension. Throw in pressure, you have a sixth dimension. All right, and so evaluating these things would have to be done using an analytic approach which is all rooted in this, this stuff, all this material. All right, so you don't want to you don't want to gloss over the skill in in favor of just the technology because the, you know the technology will let you down at some point. All right, but for now it's a good it's a good resource. So let me uh, let me bring you to a, a crunchier one, something with a little extra oomph. Uh, actually, let's look at number twelve. It it looks like it. Doesn't really have much oomph, but it's, it's got some oomph. So we try applying the limiting constant. Replace each x with a zero. So zero minus two over zero squared. 
you get negative 2 over 0. All right. Now that's not indeterminate. All right. It's not 0 over 0. That's undefined. But undefined doesn't always mean D and E. So what we would have to do is investigate to make a determination of whether we're dealing with a D and E situation or if we're dealing with an, a limit that actually exists. Now, if a function goes vertical at any point, it could just be that it has a, a, a vertical asymptote or maybe it's just a vertical tangent. All right, we don't necessarily know that going in, but in, in the idea here is that we're trying to do it without looking at the graph. So what we would do here is find the limit as x approaches zero from the left of x minus two over x squared and the limit as x approaches zero from the right of the same thing. And then we would use, we, we'd use a test value, all right? Some number that's close to zero but left of it and some number that's close to zero but right of it. Because the idea here is we know that there's a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. So the choices are that this graph is either, in terms of the, the two curves coming in from the left and the right, those curves are either going to the same infinity or they're going to different infinities. If they're going to the same infinity, then the limit exists. If they're going to different infinities, then the limit does not exist. So I'm just looking for the sign of the computation. So what I'll do here is find the limit as x approaches negative, you know, pick something that's really close to zero, but on the left, let's say negative 0.1. So I'll say negative one tenth. And then do the same thing on the right side except with a positive one-tenth. Try to pick something convenient, all right? So if I take a negative one-tenth, negative one-tenth minus two over negative one-tenth squared, positive one-tenth minus two over positive one-tenth squared. I'm just gonna smidge this down, oops. So this is obviously more of a numerical approach, as you can see. But I tried to choose relatively convenient numbers because negative one-tenth minus two is negative two, two and one-tenth, all right, which is easily converted into an improper fraction, negative 21 over 10. Negative one-tenth squared is one over 100. All right, keep change flip, you're gonna get negative 210. All right. And tried to choose numbers that were easy to compute, you know, I'll say manually, but at least in your head. All right, one-tenth minus two, two is the same as 20 over 10, so one minus 20 is negative 19. negative 19 tenths over 1 one hundredth, that's gonna be negative 190, all right? We're looking at two extremely large values both in the negative direction, all right? It's telling us that both parts of this graph are going down substantially. If they're both going down substantially, then the limit would have to be negative infinity because they're both going to the same type of infinity, all right? It's a numerical approach. Now, I'm not telling you you can't use a calculator. So this number crunching, you know, it's kind of like a, uh, kind of an archaic way of doing it because it's like, well, if you're gonna use a calculator to do the number crunching, why wouldn't you do the calculator to do the whole thing? It's really just so that you could use the calculator to support your understanding of the skill, all right? It's not ideal, but it is what it is as Mr. McCauley said that one time. All right, so negative infinity. And of course, you could verify with your calculator. So 
So x minus 2 over x squared. Take a look at the picture. You see it's going down at different rates, but it's going down from the left, from the right. So we're in good shape there. All right. So let me do one more crunchy algebraic one. Something to keep you from pulling your hair out. You may look at number 16 and say, please do that. That's actually really easy. I'm going to leave that one for you to do on your own. Oh, oh, I already did these. I don't want to steal my own thunder here. All right, well, I got an idea. Clear page. So let's take a look at number 21. Look at that puppy. I can take requests after I do this one. Fractions involving radicals are... They're really not that bad. They just look terrible. They're very frightening. However, once you recognize that it's pretty much the same technique every time, then it's, it's a whole lot easier than you might realize initially. All right, first thing you'd wanna do is make sure that it's not a trick question and apply the limiting constant. All right, so that is replace each of your x values with whatever the limiting constant is. So we're looking at one plus zero under a radical minus <coughs> one minus zero under a radical over zero. I gotta say, in most cases, it's gonna be sort of a waste of time because in most cases, it's gonna give you a zero over zero for the problems I give you anyway, which tells you you gotta do the algebra anyway, but there will be the rare problem like the one we just did where it gives you something other than that so it makes it, it makes it worth it to do, at least look at it uh, in, to some extent every time. All right. So whenever you're dealing with a sum or product of radicals, this is an old Algebra 2 concept. You might remember the concept of a conjugate. All right. You might have even gotten into complex conjugates, except these aren't complex numbers. Complex are involve imaginary. It's not the case here. Yeah. <coughs> Multiply by the conjugate top and bottom of the expression involving the radical, which just means take the nasty expression that involves the radical, rewrite it, reversing the middle sign. The whole point behind this is to manufacture a difference of perfect squares. All right, it won't be exactly a difference of perfect squares, it'll just look like it. All right, it'll have the same structure. If you have a difference of perfect squares, when you, when you distribute it out, you know, something, I'll take something simple, like x plus two, x minus two. You go and foil that out, first outer, inner, last, or double distribute, the two middle terms always cancel out. You're left with just the first term and the last term. That's the whole point. That's what we want to do. All right. Except with this big old nasty expression. All right. So that's telling us that all we have to do if we multiply by a conjugate is multiply the first radical by the first radical and the last radical by the last radical. And because they're identical, it's really the same as saying radical 1 plus x quantity squared is just going to become 1 plus x minus radical 1 minus x quantity squared. It's just going to become a 1 minus x. But because you're subtracting the entire expression 1 minus x, we got to put it in parentheses. All right? The bottom is going to be pretty nasty. But it'll clean itself up nicely in a sec. All right. When you distribute the top, things should cancel. All right. So we're looking at 1 plus x minus 1 plus x. <coughs> the 1 and the negative 1 will cancel away. The whole, everything else is going to stay put for a sec. but you'll be left with just a two X on the top. The X's will cancel. Boom and shakalaka. One minus one. Yeah. 
the the conventional cancellation. Oops. So the x is canceled by division. And now we have this expression here, which doesn't look much better than what we started with. So you would think, okay, well, what did we accomplish? Well, we'll actually be in a pretty good spot because if I replace each of these x's with a zero, it doesn't make it undefined or indeterminate anymore. It certainly wasn't going to make it indeterminate. We had, we had a two on the top with no variable. <coughs> right? There was no way that was becoming zero. Right? At worst, it would become undefined. And then we, we know we have other techniques for finding the limit when that happens. All right? But if I replace each of these x's with zeros, I'm going to get 2 over radical 1 plus radical 1. Radical 1 is 1, so 1 plus 1 is 2. 2 over 2 is 1. It, you know, it takes a little doing, obviously. That's a fair amount of algebra right there. But it's manageable as long as you apply the appropriate technique to get started. You know, in every one of these cases, you'll know the answer before you even get started with the algebra. Just put it into Desmos. But you, you, you need the algebra. Uh, the radical 1 plus radical 1 gives you a 2 on the bottom. So then 2 divided by 2. Was there another one? I, somebody said 18? I think they said 19. 19? Oh, yeah, 19's a good one. It's a good looking problem right there. If I was left to select one to go over with you all, that would have been the one. I guess they're all right with it, though. So, for number 19, folks, fraction over a fraction. A couple of ways to handle it. One way would be to clean up the numerator here. Another way would be to clear out all the denominators. I mean, you can go in a couple of different ways. I don't want to waste too much of your time, but uh, I'll just pick one way and go with it. Uh, most people will get a common denominator for the numerator and just go from there. So I'm going to multiply, bless you, top and bottom by 3. Multiply top and bottom by x. All right. So we're looking at 3 minus x over 3x over x minus 3. Again, finding the limit as x approaches 3. I skipped the step where you would plug the 3 in and get 0 over 0. We'll just take it on faith in this case. I mean, you could visually inspect and see you're going to get 1 over 3 minus 1 over 3, which is 0, over 3 minus 3, which is also 0. So either way. But still a fraction over a fraction, but that x minus 3, I could write that as an x minus 3 over 1. So I'd rewrite this as limit as x approaches 3 of 3 minus x over 3x times, keep change flip, 1 over x minus 3. Now x minus 3 and 3 minus x, those are exact opposites of one another. All right, you could tell because the 3 is positive and then it becomes negative. And so in the numerator it's positive, in the denominator it's negative. In the numerator the x is negative, in the denominator the x is positive. So those two expressions are exact opposites of one another. Whenever you divide two expressions that are exact opposites, the result is always equal to negative 1. You know, pick any two numbers that you know are opposites, the result's always going to be equal to negative 1. So cancel to a negative 1, limit as x approaches 3, of negative 1 over 3x. Now I would apply my limit by substituting in the 3. Negative 1 over 3 times 3 gives you negative 1 ninth, and there you go. All right, so a little algebra skills for you. All right. So I'll save